Evening, everybody. Oh, that was nice and quiet and dull, wasn't it? Good evening, everybody. <laughs> Love it. Cool. It's, it's great to have you all here this evening for our talk on existential buoyancy. Before I introduce um, Yannick, I just want to check who's who's an, uh, who's been to a London lecture before. Wow, loads of us. Who's new to a London lecture? Oh wow, loads of us too. Um, who's uh, not an animus student or about to become an animus student? I don't know why I'm <laughs> Cool, lovely. So uh, welcome to those of you that this is your first London lecture and welcome to you that uh, are not part of the animus community. Uh, we have these London lectures sort of every two or three months where we explore a theme or an idea um, around the coaching and self-development world. Um, and we also have some other things that we do, like the Annuous Summer Picnic next weekend. Okay, so um, if you're around, it's in Hyde Park. Um, come along. All the details are on the. Are they on the website? Facebook. On Facebook, of course they are. They're on Facebook. Where yeah. everything. This Sunday. This Sunday. So come along. Um, and the other thing, there are lots of things on there, but I won't mention all of them. Just the Annuous Summit. Have you got your tickets for the Animus Summit? Yes, Robert, we have. Awesome, that's great. Um, it's going to be a, a brilliant day, the, the summit, so it's going to be great to see you all there. Um, and if you have no idea what I'm talking about, summits and picnics, then please feel free to grab me after the event just so I can uh, introduce you to Animus and what we do and what we're all about. So I'm going to stop speaking in a few moments and I'm going to introduce our speaker for this evening, who's going to be talking about um, existential buoyancy. Let's please give him a really warm welcome to Danny Jacob. Thank you very much. Um, well, welcome to this beautiful uh, little talk. Um, I really like Animus because uh, of this atmosphere. <laughs> Um, the first time I came into an animus environment, uh, it struck me immediately how passionate uh, most of the people here are about coaching. Um, and about quite a specific kind of coaching, because it's not the, the purely performance coaching, it's, uh, it's actually about transformation. Uh, it goes a lot deeper, and uh, most of you will know Nick, uh, the founder of the school. Um, that's how I connected to him. I was looking for other people who are into existential coaching, existential philosophy, and uh, I, I found a tweet of his, and uh, a minute later I was talking to him on Facebook, uh, and I said, hey, uh, you know, let's meet, because uh, this stuff is really quite powerful, and uh, we seem to, there seem to be only a few people who know this. So uh, we've been on a mission to spread that word. Um, arguably, Nick is a, lit, a little bit more successful at spreading this word, <laughs> but um, I'm, I'm trying to help him out as much as I can. That's why I started doing the, the CPD training uh, for school. And just to explain how this topic tonight came about, uh, I just want to tell you how I got in touch with it. Um, don't worry too much about the slides, uh, I'll probably be talking freely most of this time, but uh, this is for you to have afterwards, please write me a message, I'll send you the slides, uh, so you have a little bit on, on paper, uh, well, paper. Um, and just to kind of guide us through so we have a little bit of, of structure. Um, I do like having conversations, so I might, I might draw on what you actually think about this stuff. I get you talking to each other a little bit, and uh, then I'll introduce you to uh, what I consider existential buoyancy to be. Um, how I got interested in it is, I, throughout my life I realized, I was, I was, people said, oh, you always have a big smile on your face, and uh, you know, you, you seem to be this, this happy person. And I realized, yeah, actually I, I do feel quite good about a lot of things and a lot of bad things happening couldn't really throw me down that much. You've heard of the concept of resilience. Uh, one of the last long lectures was about that as well. So some people seem to have a tendency to float the top um, of this storm of life, sometimes big waves, sometimes small waves, but there's a lot of bad weather in life, I'm sure you would all agree. And to float atop of that, uh, I was really interested in how people are doing this. Uh, what makes people special in terms of floating atop when life gets really tough? And 
I studied uh, positive psychology, which is the study of what's right with people, which I found fascinating and very much part of this. A lot of research into resilience, into what makes a good life. And, uh, but there was something missing because life really is quite tough. Life throws us a lot of lemons, uh, as the saying says. And uh, some people make lemonade, uh, other people paint them gold, uh, other people uh, eat them and it's really sour. So existentialism for me was really about that. It's uh, being aware and realistic about all the bad things in life, all the difficult, challenging things in life, and how we can actually deal with them in a more positive way. So having gone through positive psychology and existentialism, I naturally combined them because I was looking at positive psychology through an existential lens, and I was looking at existential thought through a positive psychology lens. So for me, it came quite naturally to put them together. And I've heard a lot of people, when you mention existentialism, it's often portrayed as quite dark, as quite negative. Um, I'm, I've been trying to wear like dark black clothes, uh, <laughs> usually sit in a French restaurant and uh, smoke a couple of goulas or something. Um, but that's what I tend to get from existentialism. That, you know, oh, life's meaningless and uh, we're all going to die and we're all alone, really. And uh, that, I, I get that. But having looked at the original text, having, having talked about philosophy, having connected this to what's happening in everybody's life every day, I, I don't see it negative at all because there's so much freedom in it and so much positive energy and so much life. And this is something that I love to share with people because every time you feel bad or very emotional or something, it's very, very valuable. And this is really what I want to talk to you about today. How, how can we look at existential thought through a very positive lens? So how can we float the top of all these bad things happening in life while still having this kind of optimistic, cheerful outlook on it? And that's really what buoyancy means. Um, I had to look it up. Uh, who else had to look it up? You only what buoyancy meant? Excellent, okay. Uh, I'm, I'm from Germany. <laughs> um, but that was, I, at first I thought like, hmm, that's a really interesting term because uh, I am quite cheerful and optimistic, but at the same time it's about, it's about floating, it's about riding that wave. So this is what today's talk is about. Just a few, few words about myself. I, I work uh, mainly at, the Uli, uh, at UEL, that's the University of East London. I run a master's program there and we are developing uh, positive psychology coaching further. So I do that for quite a few days a week and then I run my own uh, private practice and coaching. Um, I added mediation, conflict resolution to it, which I think existentialism is, is a philosophy of conflict, you know, and to help people facilitate that resolution of these conflicts, inner conflicts or with other people. So personal development is really my thing and I love giving people that space to think I love making people think, and I hope to make a lot of you think a little bit tonight. Um, if your head starts smoking, do raise your hand. If you have questions, please throw it in. Yes? Oh, it's already smoking. Great. <laughs> oh, because you were raising your hand. Okay. Um, so I give people space to think. I want to make you think. And um, if you're interested in training in existentialism, positive psychology, uh, talk to Robert, talk to me. Um, we can, we can point you the way. Um, I do work at schools, so I wrote a curriculum with a few people uh, to actually teach some of this stuff, to teach personal development, to teach people to get in touch with who they are and learn life skills. Uh, some of that I do in the coaching room, some at schools. And I'm also really interested in the overlap between coaching and therapy. Where's the boundary? Uh, where's the gray area? And you'll realize as we go on tonight that existentialism and positive psychology, existential buoyancy, there's a lot when we work with that stuff, one-to-one -one in a room with people. It's very difficult to say this is the line where therapy stops and coaching begins. Because they're big questions. People are concerned with big questions. And that's really what I want to start with as well. Um, so we're going to look at the big questions and what matters most in life. Looking at Quick introduction into existentialism, what are the main themes, a bit about positive psychology and what makes life worth living, 
And then I'm going to try to uh, tell you my perspective of how we can bring these two together. So we can actually float the top and develop existential buoyancy, existential resilience. Um, so I want you to talk to your neighbor for a bit. Um, I assume that most of you are either familiar or already coaching. Um, turn to your neighbor or groups of three and uh, just a few minutes think about what brings people to you as a coach. You know, what kind of things do they come with? What kind of concerns? What kind of issues? And uh, take two minutes and then let's see what's actually in the room, what matters to people. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So, what, what's coming up? Well, what matters to people? Why do they come to coaching? Careers. Careers. Career improvement. Changes, improvements. Mm -hmm. What change. else? Change. Mm -hmm. What kind of change? Positive change. Mm -hmm. What else? Uh, relationships and human connection. Relationships, Unhappy. connections, happiness, unhappiness. Indecisiveness. Indecisiveness, decision making. Mm -hmm. Frustration. Frustration. Lack of control over their lives. Lack of control over their lives. Mm -hmm. Ambition. Ambition. Safe emotional space. Just seeking that out. Mm -hmm. Excellent. I think there are many reasons, individual reasons, but ultimately I think the one thing I identify with my clients is an initial disassociation from themselves mm -hmm. and a fundamental idea about somewhere they need to reintegrate with their own authenticity. Yeah, authenticity is uh, screaming at me there. You know, getting in touch with yourself and you really are. What, what else do these have in, in common? I just wanted to share what Erica said, which was self-trust, which mm. I, I think that's really fundamental. If you can actually trust your own experience, then you can aspire to have um, an authentic life, yeah. Mm -hmm. Without that inner compass, then yeah. how do you know how to decide anything? You know? Yes, we can make decisions much easier if we are, if we know who we are, mm -hmm. and if we have confidence mm -hmm. in, that this is really who we are. Mm -hmm. You know, and we we're looking for certainty as well. Mm -hmm. You know, um, a lot of what I've heard was about some form of feeling good or better. Mm -hmm. Would you all agree with that? Because mm -hmm. I found with. Pretty much all of my clients, if, if you do a technique called lettering, which means, you know, what's behind that? Why do you want the career? Or why do you want the change? Um, why do you want the million dollars? Why do you want the promotion? If you letter that down to the very end, it's usually some form of feeling good or better. And I found that quite significant, because that's really what positive psychology has been researching. You know, what, what makes a good life? What does it actually mean to feel good? What different forms of happiness are there? So at the end, there's always some, some form of happiness that people are looking for. And when we do the same with therapy, I, I, find, I find the same. At the end, people want to feel good. You know, if that's coaching or therapy, depends a little bit on the content that they bring. It doesn't necessarily matter how, what you're working towards. You know, sometimes, traditionally, you take the problems away and if you don't have problems anymore, your life is certainly better and you're feeling better than you were before. But at the same time, not having problems doesn't necessarily mean that we're happy. So this is where positive psychology came in. Existentialism is looking at, well, what are the, the existential issues in life? What's the human condition? What are these problems, this discomfort, this anxiety? And positive psychologists said, well, that's only one side of the coin. We actually need to also look at, you know, what, what's, good, what's good with people, what's right with people. How, what does happiness consist of? How can we create that? So, the big question, one of the very big questions is, how can I be happy? How can I live a good life? You know, how can I, how can I feel okay? How can I get in touch with myself? How can I be authentic? How can I be certain in an uncertain world? Yeah? Can I, uh, can I challenge that? Sure. So, um, is that all there is? What do you mean? Happiness. Like, mm -hmm. can, can I be okay mm -hmm. with sadness? Mm -hmm. yeah. What's wrong with that? Yeah. yeah, well, sadness is very valuable. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of people who feel very good in their sadness. Mm -hmm. You know, because it's, it might be a secure place or a familiar place. Um, 
Most people would try to avoid sadness, they'd rather be happy. But other people feel quite happy when they're sad. So in a, in a way, it's all very individual. You know, what, what do I choose to feel? How do I want to feel? And if I say sadness is a good feeling, then you can't take that away from me. You know, if I say, well, I want to feel sad because, you know, that feels good to me, then you should, that, that's okay. But that's not quite what yeah. I was getting to there. Mm -hmm. what, what I'm getting to is that why does it have to be polarized as good mm -hmm. or bad? Why can't it be neutral? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I wanted to, to answer mm -hmm. to because uh, it's, a, it's a statement, it's a judgment, you know, of us. Mm -hmm. It's a personal judgment whether I think something is good or bad. Mm -hmm. So it, it doesn't have to be that polarity of if it's good or bad. It's about what you want. So if feeling sad, if that's something that you, that, that's okay, or that you want, then you can walk towards that. Mm -hmm. Does that meet more what you, what you meant? Oh. Maybe you're agreeing to acceptance that you have to accept that. Accept mm -hmm. negative feelings as well. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't, I don't see it as negative. I just yeah. see it yeah. as a feeling. It's Absolutely. Like as a, as yeah. an energy. That that'll that'll come up very very clearly. <laughs> At least I hope so. If not, challenge me again, please. Yes. I just want to say that maybe this is about being able to feel. Being able to feel. Being able to feel whatever is necessary at the moment. We don't have to jump into mm -hmm. super high happiness. Yeah, giving it a meaning. Mm. Doesn't have to have a meaning. It doesn't have to have a meaning. So whatever at that moment makes me yeah. This is another big question. What's meaningful in life? What makes life meaningful? Um, there's a lot of big questions in life that, that clients ask themselves. And uh, what they all seem to allude to is three really big, big areas in life. Um, what, what couldn't we do without? Water. Uh, if, we didn't, if we don't have water, what happens? <coughs> we die. That means we don't exist anymore. That's pretty bad. Well, bad or good, you know, let's <laughs> say. <laughs> Some people choose to do that. Um, but certainly it is not being. It is non-being. It is death rather than being alive. And most people would avoid dying and they'd rather live. They'd rather exist. Um, but yeah, existence is pretty important to people. What else? What's the worst thing that society here can do with people other than killing people? Ostracize. Ostracize, not talk to them. What? Yeah? Isolate. Isolate. Prison. You know, we put people in prison. What do we take away by that? Freedom. Freedom. They can't choose. They're being told what to do most of the day. They have very little spare room to decide. <coughs> Which is autonomy. We're taking away their autonomy. It feels really bad. Sensory deprivation. Mm -hmm, exactly. So we feel less. You know, people make themselves feel by cutting themselves or banging their head against the wall or starting random fights. You know, we we want to we want to exist. We want to have agency, autonomy, to be able to decide to do what we want to a certain extent, and ultimately we want to feel good. So. To me, it seemed that these three areas are really key. And existentialists have looked at questions of existence and what it means to be alive. Coaching is ultimately about being enabling people to choose, to move, to change, you know, to, to have agency about their lives. At least that's what coaching is to me. And positive psychology has looked at what happiness is. So we can bring them together. Here's a couple of these big questions. In the being area, the existence area, what, what is existence? What, what does it mean to be here? What does it mean to be alive and in the world with other people? Who am I, you know? Authentically, what's important to me? What are my values? Why am I doing the things that I do? Why am I here on this earth or in this job or in this relationship? We ask ourselves these big questions in this area. In coaching, Agency, we ask ourselves, how can I be free in a world full of restrictions, full of things that influence us? How do I make the right choices? What is right and wrong? You know, should I, should I strive to be sad or strive to be happy? Um, 
How do I make right choices and what is right? How do I balance what I want with what other people want from me? Our parents want certain things for us. Society wants something from us. Everywhere there's messages about how we're supposed to lead our lives. And that influences us. But then, authentically, we, can, might, we might be in touch with something that we really know is right, but then other people tell us that you should do that. So then we have a conflict. What are the things that we can change? What are the things that we cannot change? And how can we tell the difference? Again, for me, a lot of coaching is about that, finding out what you can do and can influence and what you perhaps need to accept and let go. You know, I had a 12-year-old kid at school and I told them that the only certain thing in life is death. We're all going to die. And Chuck, who was 12 years old, said, well, you don't know that. <laughs> I was like, uh, uh, he's like, oh, you're old, so uh, <laughs> I'm going to live a lot longer than you, so uh, they, might, they might find a cure about this death thing. And I couldn't really argue with it, because I don't know. Who knows? Maybe? You know, maybe somebody can prolong the life of the body or a decaying process, and we actually might live longer or forever. I don't know. I think it's highly unlikely, but it's possible, I guess. Um, but how can we tell the difference? For example, if somebody comes up to you as a, as a coaching client and says, I want to compete in the Olympics, I want to run 100 meter Olympic race. And you look at them, and they have no legs. They're in a wheelchair. What do you say to them? That's impossible? You say, tell me about it. Well, I would say, tell me about it. You know, because everything else comes from assumptions. We assume that this person cannot run because they have no legs. Fair assumption. Exactly. Could have waited for that for a minute. <laughs> no, but it's true. Like Oscar Pistorius made it happen. He had no legs. And if you start listening to this person, you might say, well, in 10, 15 years, 20 years, you know, the prosthetics, uh, they are really well developed. And there's a lot of movement in that science, that area of science. And I think in 20 years, if the Olympic Committee allows it, I think I might be able to compete in the Olympics. Not Paralympics, Olympics. But you could have fairly assumed that this person does not have a chance to ever run in the Olympics because they have no legs. So it's important to figure out what we can and what we cannot do. Because that's what we do as coaches. You know, we, we see limiting beliefs and we challenge them. So again, a lot of big questions there. What makes life worth living? How can I be happy? What should I do with my life? What's my life mission? Where do I belong? How do I relate to people? You know, what do I actually want? How can I be authentic? How do I avoid conflict? Or what do I do with conflict when it, when it appears? Lots of big questions that clients come and want to explore in whatever mode. Therapy, coaching, I don't distinguish there too much because if people ask themselves big questions, I definitely have an open ear. And then I make a decision if I'm a good person for them. So, existential, hands up, how many have, are familiar with like the basic tenets of, of existentialism? Excellent. So, in essence, it's a philosophy about human lived experience. It's about what does it mean to be alive in a world with others? There's certain, certain feelings, certain results that come out of this condition. Just being alive and in a world with other people who are all different. So existential philosophers like Heidegger and Sartre, Nietzsche, Buber, these guys have thought about, okay, what, what happens there? What, what, what is the result of being alive and in the world with other people? And they came to certain conclusions. They don't agree on many things, but all of them agree on some things. And that's the really important things. So, for example, they all agree that we're going to die at some point, and we don't know when. It might be tomorrow, it might be in 80 years. All we know is that there's a certain ending. There's temporality. Time is limited here. And that can be really scary, because we, we just don't have that certainty of when it's going to happen. And if you ask people if you could know exactly when you're going to die, that makes a huge difference. Because if you know it's 60 years, you know, you know that you need to 
work hard, build some stability, whatever you choose to do, you have that many years. If somebody tells you you have three months to live, almost everybody changes their life. They go rob a bank and go to Hawaii, <laughs> or they quit their job and spend more time with their family, or they finally tell the person that they love them. You know, there's a lot of things that people do. Time matters. So I think I said we get thrown into this world and we exist towards our death every single minute. And it might be tomorrow, or in five minutes. I might have a heart attack now. Who knows? I don't know that. But I might be. Have I all done all the things that I wanted to do with my life? Probably not. There might be some things that I still want to do. Why do I not do them tomorrow? Why am I talking to you instead? <laughs> you know? I should be writing that book. So, temporality matters. Our death matters. It also gives meaning to our life. Because if there is no ending, um, there are science fiction stories about people who live forever. Their, their psychology is very different, because they have all the time in the world. Why do it tomorrow if you could do it in a thousand years? It's still going to get done eventually. But if you tell somebody, hey, by the, day, the, by the way, the deadline is in a week, you know, people really get going, and they produce, and they do stuff. Yeah, like, can you give me an example of a science fiction book I could read on that subject? Because I find that quite interesting. Lord of the Rings. Lord of the Rings. The elves. Oh. I mean, elves can die, but like, they don't die naturally. Vampires, I guess. Vampires as well. Yeah, I mean, so there's a lot of vampire stories, very, very interesting. Mm. Uh, the one with Tom Cruise was, was particularly good. Vampire. Interview with a yeah. vampire. Because that goes through hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. It's brilliant. Um, when people get older, around birthdays, you know, all of a sudden, people shift mm. what's meaningful to them. Mm. That's why people start freaking out when they turn 20, 30, 50, 60. You know, because they get reminded that death comes closer. Mm. So that gives a lot of people a lot of energy. You know? Mm. If we are... We, we cannot be certain when anything happens, yet we strive for certainty. So we, use, we tend to make decisions once we're certain about the outcome. These are easy decisions. If I do this, this is going to lead to that, and I can make a decision whether I think that's good or not. So then we do it. But with no decision, really, we can be 100% certain. If I make a decision that I'm going to leave this room now, I cannot be certain if I arrive. Because again, I might have a heart attack, somebody might stop me, somebody might have locked the door. Mm. Who knows? So life in itself is uncertain. Even in physics, we have found the uncertainty principle by Heisenberg. That, you know, we cannot really say if a particle is in one spot or not in one spot. You know, we don't know. Life is uncertain, but yet we're looking for certainty. We are connected to other people, we're social animals. We really need that human connection. We cannot survive on our own. You know, there are people who live in complete solitude, uh, away from everybody else, but usually they go nuts. <laughs> you know, if they don't, they imagine other people to be there. We always live, exist in relation to other people. And we naturally compare ourselves to them about how much they earn, about what their, uh, what their jobs are, what they're doing with their lives, you know? So we always compare ourselves. It's, it's good because it drives us. Competition is amazing in terms of producing things, of getting people to be better at what they do. But at the same time, it's a curse, because if we always compare ourselves, we can never fully be happy, because there's always somebody who's better off, in our view. Again, one of these inner conflicts that just make us feel uncomfortable. And if there was a meaning of life, one meaning of life, where our existence is going as a whole, our human brains wouldn't be able to comprehend it. We can create meaning in our lives by choosing to do something that is meaningful to us, that feels meaningful, but as a whole, we don't know if the world has any meaning to it. You know, we're just a, a, a flicker, you know? Our existence is so short if you compare it to the universe as a whole. So we're looking for meaning. Uh, the worst things that happens to us is we can't make sense of things. So we're trying, we're going crazy if we can't understand some things. Why, why did this happen? It has no meaning. So we're trying to create this meaning. And sometimes we, uh, people accept a ridiculous explanation for something just so it, there is an explanation. If we don't have an explanation for something, we really dig into it to try and make something, like understand it, create meaning. So we're meaning-making machines. Do you have an example of a situation like that? Um, for example, 
I don't know, a crime scene. Um, we need to solve the crime. There's lots of like crime thrillers and uh, detective stories. Um, a lot of a lot of these detectives in, might accept, might uh, have a theory that they really hold on to, because everything else doesn't fit in how they make sense of the world. So I mean, obviously these were in love, so they don't kill each other. And if that's the your view of the world, you would accept an explanation or, uh, yeah, the gardener did it because he was in love with her. But actually, he just accepts that explanation so it makes sense to him. It might be something else, but that would really rattle his worldview, and all of a sudden the world wouldn't make sense anymore. So this is, I think, what happens in trauma, for example. Uh, your worldview gets shattered. For example, uh, you, are, you always believe that your president is going to protect you from uh, harm in your own country. And all of a sudden, a plane flies into your workplace. That really screws with your worldview. So you have to remake sense of things. And that can be a painful process. So people try to avoid it. So they might believe in conspiracy theories or uh, other things. You know, there's a lot of people who are believing in conspiracy theories because they want the world to make sense in that way. So as a result of this human condition of being in the world with other people and having all these conflicts in us. There's anxiety, there's discomfort. We don't feel good all the time. You know, there's, there's a lot of stuff that is inevitable, inevitable human uh, inner conflict. We see somebody else and we see they're better off and we see another person that is worse off. So how should we feel? You know, should we aspire to be like this or like that? There's a lot of this going on and we can't really avoid that. We can try to avoid it, but that means also avoiding life. So, themes like freedom, choice, we need, to, we, we, have, we need to choose what we want to do. We need to make so many decisions on a daily basis. And there's really no rules other than the ones we make or the ones we accept from other people. The law is a rule book and we can choose to accept it. A lot of people choose to not accept it and do their own thing. But they need to choose that and accept the consequences. That is taking responsibility. You know, if I do something that's against the law, I can do that. People might try to stop me, but I can make that decision as long as I'm okay with accepting the responsibility for my actions. And that's something I believe very strongly. A lot of people trying to push their personal responsibility away. And a lot of our coaching clients might say something like, oh, I have no choice but to do this. And as a coach, we would challenge that. Yeah, is that really the only choice you have? We're looking for purpose. We're looking for direction. And there's no other purpose and direction than the one we choose or, again, we accept from others. You know, we always con uh, compare ourselves with other people. We try to connect with other people. But we can never be 100% somebody else. We can never completely fuse. We all try when we are between 12 and 15 to become one person and then we go on a holiday and we go to the zoo. But that almost never works out because there's two individuals who want to form an alliance. But there can never be one unit. Because you might be with your wife for 60 years, but you will not be able to read her mind. Maybe sometimes. But really, do you really know what the other person is thinking at that very moment, all the time? So we always we get born alone, we die alone. So it's one of these things, but it's, it's also inherently positive. Because we, we really connect with others, and we're so individual. And we want both. We want to belong to a group, and we want to be ourselves, our individual selves. We want to be special. But we also want to belong. So existentialism is about looking at people holistically, looking at the whole person, looking at what their values are, what their beliefs are, what makes them tick. How do they relate to each of these dimensions of existence that uh, Amy van Dersen came up with? She said there's, there's a personal dimension where we, where we look at who we are, what's our identity. Uh, there's a social, a social dimension, how we relate to other people. There's a, a spiritual dimension about like how we make sense of the world. What is our faith? How do we think the world works? What do we believe in? Um, I'm forgetting one. Social, personal, spiritual. 
What else? Emotional. Emotional? Yes. No. <laughs> um, Mental. 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 Physical. Physical. Personal, social. Spiritual. Oh, interesting. <laughs> social, spiritual. Cultural. I'll come back to you on this because it'll it'll just come back to me. Yeah. Um, so we're looking at people on the on the whole of their existence, and these existential givens are universal. They're a result of being in the world with other people. They're not a result of being a specific race. They're not a result of uh, of uh, being a specific person. We all have that in common. We all share that. So, this is existentialism in a nutshell. Mm. You know, there's a lot of inner conflict going on, on many different dimensions, and we can't really avoid a certain amount of anxiety in our lives. If we try to avoid that, something we call bad faith, then we actually avoid living as well. If we avoid in taking any kind of risk, mm. do we really live? Because chances are we're not going to go outside of the house. Chances are we're not going to go for something that really means something to us because we might fail. You know, it, it, avoiding risk is avoiding life. And existentialism is about meeting life created, uh, courageously, you know, developing the courage to live, the courage to face all of these anxieties, you know, to, to embrace them, to see them as something valuable. Positive psychology, on the other hand, is about what's right with people. What's, what's a good life? And first and foremost, it's a science. You know, it's a scientific way, an empirical way, to look into what's good with people, what's right with people. Look into what matters in terms of happiness, in terms of uh, what resources do we have? How can we build defenses based on our character strength, based on developing optimism? What are positive emotions good for? We all know negative emotions help us survive by, for example, being disgusted by something and not eating it, by being scared and running away or having more energy to fight. Positive uh, emotions, we haven't actually looked at that because they never caused any problems. So positive psychologists say, wait, well, actually, there's a lot more to explore than just avoiding problems, just uh, making, making bad things go away. So. We, they looked at, scientifically, looked at uh, what if we work with character strengths rather than weaknesses and make them go away? Um, how, what actually contributes to happiness? Relationships, personal, a sense of personal growth, um, having the competencies to deal with whatever life is around us. You need different skill sets for living in the jungle and living in Soho. You know? <laughs> Most of us do not have to hunt for food. Well, we have to hunt for a lot of things but not for the actual living food that's running away from us. We have to hunt for a job and then buy food. So it's a different skill set. Um, we're looking for meaning and purpose in our lives. We're looking at, we need to accept ourselves before we can change anything about us. You know, we need to know who we are before we can change who we are. So this is what positive psychology identified as, this is actually contributing to a good life. Different theories there? Yeah. Beyond the idea you just threw out there about the um, difference in our needs, I mean, does that not somehow corroborate the fact that positive psychology is a luxury? It's a what? Positive psychology and self actualization is a, is a, is a luxury. Because is it luxury? A luxury. luxury. Ah, luxury, yes. Yeah, apologies, my English not so oh, good. <laughs> My pronunciation can be very bad as well. <laughs> it's too fast. Um, it's, a, it's a luxury because, um, as you rightly said there, when you live somewhere where you have to chase your food, mm -hmm. and you have no worries about self actualization you chase your food. Mm -hmm. So it's more a case of straight away, it becomes, there's a clear divide. Mm -hmm. so you can yeah. worry about actualization and, and positive psychology. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But somewhere else, that's not somewhere very... That's a common criticism actually about positive psychology and also about existentialism that a lot of people in other parts of the world, they might have the luxury of time to think about this stuff because they're so busy hunting for the It wasn't a criticism. Oh, yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. 
change mm. the idea of having yeah. that clear divide? There's actually a criticism in there. Okay. Don't worry, I, I like <laughs> criticism. <Fair enough. laughs> but a lot of other people have said that. Actually, you know, well, is this really relevant to people who are hungry? Yes, well, that's, that's I, it. I think it's a really relevant point, actually. Yeah. However, if you, if, and I'm, I'm thinking about, um, say, the, the, um, the high priests in India. You know, I just imagine that because they, they go out hunting for food and then they beg for food, yet they are very much in a quest to self-actualization and yeah. finding out the, you know, what the meaning of life is and, yeah. and the meaning of exi existence. So well, they choose that's a, that. Yeah, so it's yeah. a different kind of, I guess, different need needs. To. Their needs yeah. are, it's a different kind of need. It comes back to Maslow as well. Yeah, yeah. hierarchy. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. So we have very clearly found that if we cannot fulfill these basic human needs, we're not gonna have time to think about any of this stuff. Yeah. Because we're gonna be busy hunting food. We're not gonna have the space to ask ourselves, what good is this? What is the meaning of my life? The meaning of my life is to hunt this food so I can eat, so I don't mm -hmm. die. Mm -hmm. express it perfectly, that's what I was trying to get mm -hmm. Very clear. But beyond that, you know, there's, uh, there's been studies, very interesting studies about just asking people how happy are you between one and 10. And they found that, uh, that homeless people in Calcutta were just marginally, uh, just a little bit happier than uh, college students in California. Yeah, mm -hmm. So that's, I mean, yes, they, they might be hungry every now and then, but like, they have a sense of community. Mm. You know, they, they have, they, some of them chose to be there, others have accepted that they're there because of circumstances they perhaps cannot influence, and they make the best out of it. Mm. So they choose an attitude, attitude towards life mm. that gets them to a six and a half. Survival is a pure purpose. purpose mm. Mm. Is, this, is this not based on faith, though? Often. Well, faith can be religious, can also be, for me, faith is a, is a worldview. Kierkegaard talks about uh, taking a leap of faith, which means bridging uncertainty with believing in something. And this might be a religion, this might be a god, but this might also be a belief that you know you need to make choices and then go through life and whatever happens happens you know you need to take a risk in order to live that's a belief so if you have that belief you're much more likely to take a risk so yes it is about faith and it is actually and, and you know following on your point it is a purpose um, and, and you know just talking about the vendors in, in Calcutta for example and it's, they have a purpose because they they're, they are in community and so the idea of what is happiness um, it doesn't come from money necessarily, yeah. or, you know, where you might live, your home. It actually comes from other things like connection yes. and, and community and family. And, yes. and, so and, each, sort of and each of these things. ones in Calcutta will have their own, their own set of what influences their happiness. Mm -hmm. For some it will be the community. For others it will be a sense of growth because they survive every single day and that you know, feels like a good skill to have. For others, again, it might be a sense of, of meaning and purpose, of uh, you know, not not being part of the system where they do a meaningless job. They'd rather exist, even if it is on the street. But don't you think you just have to look at something like uh, the phenomenon of the tough mother, for example, mm -hmm. in this part of the world, where people are like running through all sorts of things, putting them pushing themselves, mm -hmm. just because they need to feel that thing of surviving and pushing their body, mm -hmm. or foraging through forests to get like natural, you know, mm -hmm. strawberries, because mm -hmm. actually it's a basic human need that we go and look for our food. Mm. So, I, you know, it's sort of like, it's, it's almost like even in a society where you, you have the time to look and think further than, you know, have that space, mm -hmm. you're actually, all you want to do is go back to the basic human instincts. Even go to a playground. Yeah. Give yourself that thrill. Yeah. 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 On the edge of danger. Yeah. And there's other people who avoid all of that because they said, well, we as a species moved on and I'm going to make use of every single part of technology that is available. So there's so many different people. Somebody says, no, you need to get in touch with nature, you need to be out there and connected. And the other one says, well, we live in the 21st century, why would I hunt for my own food? <laughs> and I accept both of these worldviews. And that's really what's important, getting in touch with how you see the world. But not just hunting, hunting. we're all hunting. It's, it's hunting, everybody's hunting. We're, we're hunting, hunting, hunting different for things. food, mm -hmm. we are hunting for, for the job, we are hunting for... Mm -hmm. Prestige. We are hunting for the best looking girlfriend. Or best what, what does the so Buddhist monk hunt for? Content. What does the Buddhist monk hunt for? Content. Content. Yeah. The, the, Do they, the, are they hunting? I, I mean, they, they are. But they, the homeless person is not hunting, right? Homeless person chose 
not to live up to society's standards. Well, they might be part of society. They might, they might also hunt. They might hunt for appreciation or love or respect for their peers. Yeah. We're all looking for something in a way, you know, and that's that's part of the human ex uh, condition as well. We are we are driven by wanting something, yeah, that's fulfilling true. needs. Yeah, like that that pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. It's almost like. Well, yes, just, and also that's just uh, hunting for those kind of 21st century things of just using the mind. The physical body doesn't get involved in that yeah. in the same way. And there's a lot of people have the need to, to push the physical body as well. Yes, and I think that's for me what it's about, is to get in touch with what you feel an urge for, what you feel a need for, and then kind of making these decisions as to do I, do I really need that? Or is it just a need that was implanted in me by some advertising, or by something that somebody said in a lecture, or by somebody that our parents told us. In exactly, so we, we, we can never be quite sure where these things are coming from as well. In Buddhism it's taught that, um, that suffering comes from attachment. Mm -hmm. So it's not that we want the thing, it's mm -hmm. that we're attached to it, and, if, and we're not going to be happy until we get it. Yeah. I suppose attached to outcome as well. Mm. Mm -hmm. We're always looking for something. We're always like, we're always not quite satisfied with what we have right now. There's moments, sometimes long periods of time, where we feel, yes, this is it. I could stay here forever. You know, but that's the thing about change. We we don't like change. We like things to be as they are once they're good, or once we like them. But if things stay the same for too long, we get quite depressed and we get itchy and we want change. So does this positive psychology address the whole area of gratitude as well? And, um, mm -hmm. and gratitude is a big, big thing in, uh, in positive psychology because it really influences our well-being. So there's, there's too much of positive psychology to even start to give you a complete overview. I think what's important is that we, that we looked at what contributes to a good life and how it helps you look at look at concepts from a more positive angle in terms of like, oh, maybe it's beyond uh, looking at problems and fixing them, and more about looking at things from a positive angle and see what we can actually build on. Just returning to Kevin's point, though, before, which I thought was a sure. really important one, um, if we become attached to the pursuit of happiness mm -hmm. and, and start defining things as good, bad, you know, I like that feeling, mm -hmm. I don't like that feeling, yeah. then we end up in a very difficult place where we're pursuing and we're hunting for the happiness. And mm -hmm. actually what happens is that we will feel all sorts of different things in the day. Mm -hmm. And if we can become comfortable, in my experience, if we become comfortable with whatever those feelings are and discern the difference between them without judging them as mm -hmm. being, oh, it's a happy feeling, I, I want to have that one, or it's an unhappy feeling, yeah. I don't want to have that one, but just to feel them, like the weather changes. Yeah. Because everything will change. Yeah, and yet there's so many people who come to you with goals where at the end, is some form of feeling better. So every sure. coaching client is hunting for something. But that, so that the attachment to the hunt uh -huh. defies the achievement of it. Yeah, and if somebody, if I would see that somebody is so focused on the end result, I would reflect that back. You know, and I say something like, well, I, I noticed that you're very, very focused on the end result. But it's more, it's more moment to moment. So if in any moment I'm feeling a feeling and, and, and saying it's good or bad, mm -hmm then I'm either going to push it into shadow or I'm going to a attach to it and, and, and want more of it. So it's that moment to moment rather than what might happen in a coaching session, for me, you know, philosophically. Yeah. It just feels like a, yeah, a, a critical point and, and, a, and a problem I have with positive psychology. Just in the name, positive psychology, mm -hmm. we're already defining some things as positive and some things not as positive. Yeah, um, there's been a lot of discussion about whether the name is, uh, is a good fit for what it actually is. It's certainly popular. I mean, the dialogue. It certainly starts conversations. People start saying, uh, positive psychology. Oh, what's negative psychology? Mm -hmm. yeah. Most people choose positive feelings over negative feelings. Exactly. That's why a lot of coaches have a lot of money. Negative feelings, you recognize them, but then, you know, everybody, then you deal with them, and then you move them aside. Mm -hmm. That's what most people want to be able to do. Yeah. And actually, okay. just following on from that really quickly as well, is actually I think there's something to the fact that I wonder if there's a case for a negative psychology because there's so much richness in being in the muck and, and the difficult parts where we are that we try to avoid but yeah. we can't avoid. So 
you know, accepting that we're there and what comes out of it. Yeah. Because everything we are and we grow and into comes out of that yeah. part of the part. Of the yeah. Yeah. Well, negative psychology is just psychology as usual. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Most psychology focuses on negative things, how to fix them. Yeah. yeah. Or how to be in them. Really. Yeah. yeah. So I'm, I'm not going to labour it, but just one last thing. At the moment we go to positive and negative, positive yeah. negative, but automatically in dualism and we're separating something out. And it makes it more difficult, in my view, to actually be with what is there. I agree. End of, yeah? Okay, so why do we have positive psychology? Not necessarily to say this is positive and good, and this is negative and bad, but there's a spectrum that we haven't explored yet. So it gives us a new perspective on already existing ideas. We haven't reinvented the real. We have just looked at the real uh, in empirical ways. So we want to rebalance that deficit approach, that negative psychology, and add something what's right with people. You know, adding understanding to human processes so that we can understand them better and then make choices, informed choices, conscious informed choices that affect our lives and our happiness. Because coaching clients come to us with some goal of feeling better, and if we understand the processes that are involved in feeling good, then we can make choices accordingly. And good as in like what every individual chooses to be good. Uh, you, somebody mentioned positive change. You know, and positive change means you know judged by the individual who chooses the change. They say this is positive for me, but you just tell me you want to be a better bank robber. You know, I don't think that's positive. For them, that's positive. That's their worldview. And as an existentialist, I accept everybody's worldview. You know, and it might be really screwed up, and I really don't want to work with them. But that's my choice, then. This is why we have that first coaching conversation, and we contract. And we say, what do you want to work on? What can I offer? And is that a good fit? And if somebody says, I think this is positive change, and I want to work on it, and I say, well, that's horrific, then I choose not to work with them. Simple as that. But how can we bring them together? So first of all, uh, just to introduce, there's generally two broad categories in happiness that come from positive psychology. <clears throat> One is the feeling good, the kind of hedonistic pleasure, contentment, happiness. You know, there's, you go do something fun, you feel good. Another person might do something not so fun, um, let's say work in an AIDS charity in uh, Ivory Coast, you know, and you see horrific things all day long, but you go to bed, you feel really happy about what you're doing, because you're doing a good thing, you chose to be there, you're helping people out. If, that's, if you're in touch with your values there, then you're going to feel really good, even though your day was horrific. Can you see the difference? Mm -hmm. So this is very important, I think, in terms of existential buoyancy, because we need to choose what kind of happiness we are, we're striving for, or what kind of life we want to live, or what feeling good actually means to us. And another very important thing is about how do we explain good things and bad things in terms of our judgment. If we find something bad or good or anywhere along that spectrum, how do we explain that to ourselves? Usually when people say optimism, they say a generally, uh, like a dispositional optimism, a generalized outcome expectancy. Like generally I think things will be alright, would be an optimist. Or I think it's probably going to go horribly wrong. It's the pessimist in the common sense understanding. What Peterson and Seligman have added is, it's actually about how we explain things to us. When we get fired from a job, it, doesn't, it might not mean that we never find a job again. It might not mean that it was our fault. But we could also think about it as in, oh, actually, uh, if, if, we, if we get a job, some a pessimist might say, well, that was pure luck, or that's never going to happen again, or that was just because I was recommended by somebody else. So that is really important because Seligman found out that we can actually learn to be more optimistic, that we can learn to explain things, bad things, in a positive way. So it doesn't reflect on our character, but it reflects on that very moment. It's not going to be like that forever. It's not going to be stable. You know, it's going to be maybe just this time. We failed an exam, or maybe the questions were hard, or maybe I'm stupid. Maybe I'm never going to pass an exam, or maybe I'm just not so good at maths. So this is, this is important in terms of uh, people who seem to be more happy, 
they seem to explain bad things in a certain way that is more optimistic for themselves. And that's a skill we can learn. Maybe just take two minutes and uh, think about a bad event that years later turned out to have a really positive impact, uh, impact on your life. Or the other way around, a really positive event that turned, to, turned out to have some negative effects. Yeah, just two minutes within a minute. 